Hello and welcome to the podcast from Le Monde Diplomatique. My name is George Miller, and in this programme, I'm talking to a return visitor to the podcast, Gilbert Ashkar, who's Professor of Development Studies and International Relations at SOAS, University of London. Gilbert contributed an article to the June edition of the paper on the recent uprisings in Algeria and Sudan, exploring what these new movements have learnt from the failures of the Arab Spring eight years ago. When I spoke to Gilbert on the phone in late June, I began by asking him about the contrast between then, when there were many predictions of a democratic wave toppling authoritarian regimes like dominoes, and now, when reaction has been much more cautious. The circumspection with which uh, uh, what's going on in Sudan and uh, Algeria is met is, uh, I would say, rather normal. What was uh, probably uh, the result of uh, of a lot of illusions was the euphoria that you had in uh, 2011, because when when you're aware of uh, of the type of regimes that uh, any such movements uh, face in the in the Arab world, you you must be cautious in in your uh, in any expectations. And that caution was off in, uh, in 2011 uh, due to the relative facility with which uh, the initial uprising in Tunisia managed to get rid of, of their president, and uh, they were followed by, by Egypt. And this created a lot of, uh, of, uh, of euphoria, and this uh, formula, the, the Arab Spring, was to be found uh, everywhere. The model that uh, most commentators had in mind uh, was what happened in Eastern Europe. So there was some kind of expectation of of seeing the same domino effect in the Arab world leading to the downfall of uh, the last uh, major set of dictatorial uh, regimes in the world uh, as a geopolitical uh, ensemble. Of course, I'm not speaking of single states here and there, but as a geopolitical set of states. And that, that's what you had. But, of course, it, it was based on, on, on a very wrong projection of, uh, of what happened in Eastern Europe uh, onto a completely different uh, social and political scene. The major difference being the fact that in Eastern Europe, uh, what you had uh, as rulers were essentially bureaucrats. A lot of them thought that they would be able to uh, recycle their, their know-how in a market economy, in, in a completely different system. And uh, that's why we, we, we found uh, quite a lot, lot of, uh, of them, or we found quite a lot of them later on in the uh, political elites of, of these countries, uh, including uh, probably the most famous of them is Vladimir Putin, uh, who's, an, uh, as everybody knows, a former uh, agent of the FSP. So that's a completely different situation to what we have in the Arab world, where you have property classes, not bureaucrats, ruling uh, these countries. And for several of these countries, even what uh, is best described by the formula of the patrimonial uh, rule or patrimonial state, where you have a, a group, a clan, a family owning the state, literally, that is, they uh, regard the state as their their ownership. They believe they can do anything they want with the with the state income and they believe that the state apparatuses are their servants that uh, the armed forces are their private militia and, and uh, you couldn't expect such uh, regimes to fall in the eastern european manner that that's absolutely out of the question that's uh, inconceivable actually and uh, even where you had some institutional tradition where you don't have the same patrimonial pattern in a number of countries, including those where the president was toppled, which is why the president could be toppled. It's because the institution was not uh, owned by the president uh, and eventually got rid of the president when, when the president became discredited. That happens in Tunisia, that happened in, uh, in Egypt. But then 
we see in such cases that the toppling of the president is not the end of the regime. And we see it most clearly, I should say, in, in Egypt, uh, where we have had a comeback of the regime, proving that it, it hadn't uh, fallen at any, at any point, the, the, the regime itself, not the tip, not the tip of the iceberg, but the, 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 but the mass of the iceberg. And it came back with a, with a tip which is much worse than the tip they had before. I mean, uh, Sisi compared to Mubarak is... Uh, is a much more uh, repressive version. And you suggest in your article that it's more useful to think about the Arab Spring not as a short-lived series of events, but actually to view it in the context of a process which is ongoing and in which those who are rising up against their regimes are learning from the experience of the past, perhaps in, in neighboring countries or in their own country? Sure. What we, we have here, that's the other issue, it is that uh, another kind of comparison that uh, probably informed the euphoristic uh, expectations of 2011 was the, the, I mean, those uh, so-called transitions to democracy that you had in a number of countries in Latin America, in uh, East Asia, think of uh, of Brazil, think of South Korea, Taiwan, you know, uh, the, uh, Argentina and others, uh, you, you, you had a w- waves of democratization throughout this, uh, since starting from uh, Southern Europe. Portugal, Spain, and Greece in the in the in, in the mid 70s, and uh, moving forward up to the Eastern European uh, wave. But uh, I mean, in the previous cases, what you had were cases of political modernization coming on top of decades of economic and social modernization, industrialization, and the rest. Okay, and th- that's why, in a sense, the political adaptation could happen in a relatively easy manner uh, in the countries I mentioned uh, after long periods of dictatorship. Whereas in the uh, Arab region, what we have is a, is a structural blockage. It's a, you have a uh, deep social economic crisis. And in, in that regard, it, it, it's closer to Eastern Europe, with the major difference being the conditions for the change, as I said. Because Eastern Europe also had had undergone a, a very radical change of everything, social, political, and economic system. Uh, I mean, never in history have we seen such a radical change of the whole system, of the whole uh, structures of a country happen so quickly and so easily. But that's a historical exception. The Arab world today belongs more to the kind of... Uh, protracted process that you had in the transition from the monarchical uh, agrarian-based systems in Europe, for instance, uh, into modern societies. And uh, this, of course, is to happen here on a, uh, under a very different historical circumstances. But the core issue is that you have a deep structural crisis, and therefore what started in 2011, and here I'm emphasizing started, because that's, that was only a starting point, was a long-term revolutionary process of the kind that can go on for decades, actually, if you think of, uh, of some of the major revolutionary processes in history, like uh, the Chinese, the French, the, 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 the English, or whatever. And here we're speaking of countries, single countries. If you think of the European as a region, or the Western and European even, you are speaking of processes that have, be, have gone on for decades with ups and downs and revolutions and counter-revolutions and restorations of monarchies and the rest. You know, and that's basically that's a better comparison or uh, or source of expectation for uh, the, the the Arab world than uh, Eastern Europe, for instance. So, can we talk a little bit about Sudan, which is one of the main focuses of your article, and in the context of what you've been saying about the structural challenge of change, it's significant, isn't it, that protesters there 
are actually calling for a, a longer period of transition rather than quick elections and expectations of, of rapid change. Yes, absolutely. That's uh, uh, very, very uh, significant and a very important difference between uh, the uh, Sudanese movement and what we've seen in 2011 in several countries. It is this awareness that organizing elections very soon after a mass movement like this is a way of robbing the mass movement of its political conquest because when it comes to election, you need uh, uh, political machines, you, you need uh, funds, you need uh, uh, media support, you, you need a lot of things that, that those who, who lead, who led the, the revolution in 2011, for instance, didn't have. And, uh, and therefore, the, the elections favored currents that were not the initiators of the movement that had joined them, but that uh, did not represent their aspirations, but represent another set of, of reactionary aspirations. And here I'm, of course, referring to Islamic fundamentalist movements. And uh, in Sudan, of course, <laughs> this awareness is compounded by, by the fact that the regime itself is a combination of military dictatorship and Islamic fundamentalist regime. That's... Uh, the peculiarity of the Sudanese case, that's the only country in the Arab world where before the, the brief, the ephemeral uh, presidency of Morsi in Egypt, uh, that's the only country in the Arab world where the, 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 the Muslim Brotherhood were, were in power in alliance with the military, something uh, resembling uh, in some way what you had in Pakistan under the Al-Haq uh, at some point. So you have this awareness there that if they organize uh, elections uh, too quickly before uh, having been able to change the, the, the social political conditions in the country, then that, that might bring back the same, I mean, more of the same of the, of the old regime. And that's why they were insisting on having, well, the initial uh, demand was uh, four years, then they accepted as a compromise with the transitional military council that it be re reduced to three years, during which there will be uh, transitional institutions, uh, representative council, which would be co-opted, not uh, elected, if you want, co-opted by the, the, the leadership of the uprising, and uh, a transitional government, and uh, what they call a sovereignty council. So the, a set of three institutions that uh, would be tasked with creating the conditions for uh, a lasting democratization, a social, economic, and political democratization of the, of the, of the country. So that's where we see that uh, there is a, a learning curve, if you want, in this, uh, this long-term revolutionary process, that uh, people draw the lessons of what happened, and especially the Egyptian case, which is the, the, the best known. All over the Arab world, everybody knows the details even of what happened in Egypt. You can't say that about uh, Libya or Yemen or, or, or Syria, but Egypt is at the center, and everybody knows what happened in Egypt, and, and uh, especially, of course, people in Algeria or Sudan, which are the two other countries with Egypt where the army is the, the center of gravity of, political, of the political regime. And that's why we see in Algeria, as in Sudan also, this uh, awareness that uh, toppling or, or removing the president is not enough. They are not falling in the trap in, into which the, 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 the movement in Egypt fell. And what should say that the Muslim Brothers actually played a key role in fostering the illusions in Egypt about the army, the same army that will end up soon after uh, overthrowing them. So this, this did not happen in these two countries. Am I wrong to see a worrying parallel between Sudan and Egypt, where in Egypt Mubarak was eventually replaced by Sisi, and in Sudan at the moment we've got General Hamdan, who's a former right-hand man of Bashir, who's, who's in charge of his rapid support forces and ordered a, a very repressive crackdown at the beginning of, of this month. I mean, to me, from the outside, that looks like a worrying parallel with Egypt. Oh, yes. 
course, it's a world in parallel, and uh, in many ways, Hamdan is uh, is worse than Sisi in the sense that uh, Sisi is a product of the, the regular Egyptian army, and this guy is a product of militia of, of bloody militias turned into uh, security forces. Having this man as a ruler would turn Sudan into much worse than what you have in Egypt presently. But the, the, the major difference is also that. The, the, the mass movement, the, the revolutionary movement, the popular movement is much better organized than well, anything we've seen in any of the Arab countries uh, since uh, 2011. And their impact is such that it also affects the, the armed forces. And in, uh, in the last, uh, I mean, the same period where after the crackdown, you had rumors of uh, about coups, uh, coup attempts that were thwarted and uh, people arrested. And of course, anyone organizing a coup attempt under such uh, circumstances would not be someone who wants more repression, but someone who is reacting to the repression. And that's the point that is I think that that has been a key parameter in uh, in Sudan, including from the starting point when when Bashir is reported to have asked the army to to crush the movement and they they refused, but they refused because that would be taking uh, a major risk. And what they did a few days ago, and what you just uh, referred to, uh, was not a full-scale, massive frontal attack. They killed uh, over 100 uh, per, uh, people uh, over a, a couple of days, but then they, they kind of almost apologized for that, explaining that that was uh, just meant to be, uh, you know, an attempt at d- dislodging some uh, troublemakers for, from some part of her tomb or things like that. So they are not in such a position of confidence. And also they see the the international reaction, which is uh, also a factor. And the African Union is is also here taking a quite uh, helpful uh, stance on that. So it's not the same as Egypt. And that's why they are now again offering to negotiate or to resume the negotiation. So you have a tug of war, which is ongoing between the mass movement and the military, uh, the military council. And, uh, well, as I pointed to in the, in the article, the decisive factor will be the ability of the mass movement, because of its impact on the troops, to prevent the army leadership of going further. That's the, the crucial point. If this is confirmed, if the, the army, the command, sees that they risk having a major split in the, in the armed forces, this would deter them from pushing uh, through their, uh, I mean, their own uh, agenda. But, of course, there is not, no certainty about that, and that's why we have a big question mark about what will happen eventually in Sudan. But it's not done already, and so it's the impression that that was over, the game, the game is over, or anything like this, is completely wrong. It's, it's still going on. And if we're talking about a movement which has learned from the mistakes of the Arab Spring, and which is more radical than other movements, and is also at the same time better organized, then that must be causing other regimes in the region considerable worry. Absolutely, and especially the the, the, the triangle of reaction in the region, uh, which is now constituted by the Saudi Kingdom, the United Arab Emirates, and Egypt. This uh, triangle of states is like uh, you know the, the the reactionary alliances that you had against the, the French Revolution in in Europe in the 18th century, or the the 19th century. The, the, that's uh, that's something uh, quite similar, and they are very heavily intervening on the side of the military. They are supporting the military. The military are closely linked to them, especially this uh, this crop of the military, including uh, Hamidati um, Dagalu, Hamdan Dagalu, who you, you mentioned earlier they have been involved in the in the dirty war uh, in Yemen fighting uh, under uh, Saudi command so th- th- here you have a very clear connection and yes i mean th- this also shows to to the extent to which what's happening in Sudan will be determinant for the whole region in the sense that uh, a heavy defeat in Sudan will uh, 
will set back the region and uh, maybe uh, delay further uh, such uprisings for a while, where, whereas a victory of the movement in Sudan will have a tremendous uh, impact on, uh, on the region, starting with Egypt, actually, uh, where uh, the, the scenario has been completely different. So that's, that's why, yes, indeed, it's, it's creating a lot of, uh, of uh, worries in the reactionary circles, and they are, for that reason, very much interfering. And on the other hand, the, the revolutionary movement has very few real friends, you know, beyond the general uh, statements and declarations. There is uh, very little real intervention on their, uh, on their side. I was talking to Gilbert Ashkar about his article The Seasons After the Arab Spring, which is in the June 2019 edition of Le Monde Diplomatique. It's available in the print edition and on the website at mondediplo.com. If you're a subscriber, you can read the current issue online and access a complete archive of the paper going back over 20 years, as well as exploring other resources such as maps, images, the podcast archive and online exclusive content. And if you're not a subscriber, there's plenty of content online to entice you to become one, and full details on how to go about it. In the words of the late John Berger, why read LMD? To make sense of what's happening in the world, behind the misinformation. I hope you'll join me again soon for another interview with one of our contributors. Until then, thank you very much for listening, and goodbye. Goodbye.